Okay, this is, a, this is my uh, talk we, we started with yesterday called Becoming a Man of Steel. In other words, having that mental toughness to be able to be a kicker that can deliver during the most pressure time situations. Okay? Everybody can look good in practice, but that what, what really matters is when you can kick that ball when the pressure's on and the game's on the line and your teammates are dependent on you <coughs> to win the game that they've been fighting their butts off for for the last three hours. Okay, and now it's now it's your job to close to be the closer. You know, you're like the, you're like the the pitcher in baseball. You gotta deliver those perfect strikes to uh, win the game. Okay, so we talked about uh, achieving your dreams, right? We talked about that. That's the most important thing is to have a dream. Now I forgot to tell this story yesterday because, and I think it's important. Because it, 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 it really illustrates the importance of dreaming big, okay? I was a guidance counselor, still am today, but I was a guidance counselor for the last, oh, it's been 39 years, okay? And I was trained in this realistic, be realistic with people, give them, give them the realistic facts, okay? And that's kind of where my, I was coming from when my son Jay, now remember I told you yesterday, about the impact that the movie Rudy had on him. Do you remember that? Yes? Yes or no? Or do I have to tell the story again? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that set him into a dream. That, 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 that movie Rudy gave him a dream that he hadn't had previously. That was a dream to play at a Division I level of football. And he wasn't even playing football at the time. Just soccer. But he came out of that theater and said to me, Dad, I want to play Division I football. And I wanted him to play football, so I said, okay, son, because I was the football coach, and I want him back out on the team. Okay, son. Um, then, when he got into high school, had a great high school career, got All-American as a junior, <clears throat> he said to me, now he's being recruited, and he had, he had like five, six offers from D1 AA schools. And he went to visit those schools and he came back and he said, Dad, I don't want to go to any of them. I want to go to a, a Division I school. And I said, well, you know, there's a couple of Division I schools we can look into around here. And he said, no, no, no. I want to go to one of the big programs. I want Notre Dame or I want Michigan or, or a school like that. One of the big programs, University of Florida, whatever. Okay. And you know what I said to him? Remember, I'm, I'm the counselor now. I said, you can't do that. I said, Listen to me. You're in a, going to a little school in Tampa, Florida, for crying out loud. A little private school. What makes you think you're good enough to be at that level? Those guys are great at that level. You, you're not that good. He said, Dad, I know I'm that good. I can make it. Okay? He, he told me his dream was here, and I'm trying to bring him down to here. Was I right or wrong? Good question. But he dreamed here, and he ended up making it there. He got to, ended up getting the scholarship at Michigan because suddenly Notre Dame took an interest in him. Lou Holtz wanted him. And because Lou Holtz wanted him, then Michigan decided they wanted him too. Because originally they only wanted him to walk on. But as soon as Lou Holtz handed him, uh, offered him a scholarship, then Michigan offered him a scholarship. Then he had to choose between the two and he ended up in Michigan. That's a whole other story. But he was dreaming big. Then one day, about four years later, he calls me up. He's a senior in college. They just won the national championship. And he says, Dad, I've been kicking with Jason Hansen of the Detroit Lions. He's been coming over and practicing with me for the last three weeks. I'm as good as he is. I think I can play in the NFL. I said, no, you can't. What makes you think you can play in the NFL? I said, you're, you're not that good. You're okay, but you're not that good. They're really good in the NFL. He said, Dad, would you be, please be my agent? I said, I'd have to go to school to become an agent, get a license, and, and you'll never make it. So I'm not gonna bother. I wish I had. <laughs> I've been pretty rich right now. So he said to me, I know I can make it. Well. He didn't get 
invited to the combine. So he did get one workout with the Bucks. They loved him. He nailed every kick. But then the, the general manager turned around and in the draft drafted Martin Gramatica in the third round. So then no one else was interested. So he came back home and, and coached for me for three years. He was my special teams coordinator and my defensive coordinator. And we had a ball doing that. And he went out and practiced every day as kicking. And for the first time, I saw him kick in person other than in a game. And I thought, you know, I'm beginning to think he is good enough to make it in the NFL. So he started going to various tryouts and workouts and whatnot, and nothing happened for three years. Nothing. Three years. I was telling Jordan about this today. Three years. Now he didn't get a hardly a phone call. Finally, one day he calls me up and he says, Dad, I'm ready to hang it up. I'm ready to work on my business and give up this dream of, of going to the NFL. I said, no, you're not. You're too good. You're going to make it. I want you to go to another combine. See, now I was convinced he was good. And he was starting to give up on his dream. Okay? And so that combine he went to, he walked away from there with nine offers from nine NFL teams. So it was the right move. He happened to be good on the right day. A little bit of luck involved. He had to be good at the right time. And it happened for him because... But all of this is, is important because I said, as I said, you have to have that dream, right? Okay, fast forward. We talked about these things yesterday. I'm not going to repeat uh, all, of the, uh, all of the items on here. Remember, remember the ants? Automatic negative thoughts. You're going to not have them, right? Got to have thought control. State of mind is a matter of choice. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that you choose to do or think. Okay, we have free will. We can choose to think whatever we want. We can choose to be successful or we can choose to uh, have fear of failure. Fear of failure is your biggest uh, enemy of, of achieving your dream. Okay? So you have to learn to be mentally tough. You have to learn that you can and will control your thoughts. You have to get up in the day in the morning and say, this is a great day. I love to kick and I'm going to go to the weight room today and get better. Okay? So you have that attitude of, I love to work hard, and I'm going to get better every day, somehow, somewhere, every single day. Okay? You also have to be coachable. Most important. This is Superman talking to Superboy. Okay? And being coachable means that you have humility to accept the fact that you don't know as much as some other people may know, and you're willing to listen, and you're willing to take chances on changing what you do in order to get better. You have to take a risk. You have to take a chance and trust your coach. Trust Chris if he's your coach, because he knows more than most people about this. Trust him and be coachable, okay? And I talked yesterday about preparing with commitment how critical that is, how important that is, that you commit yourself to your preparation to become the best you can be. You have to give it up, your whole person, your whole body. Okay? We talked about these various quotes from especially my favorite, Vince Lombardi. Okay? Practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. You have to practice perfection. Okay? Okay, we talked about having uh, a trust in your abilities. Feel your power. You have to have faith and trust in your abilities. Okay. So that brought us right up to about here, I think, where we left off. That which does not kill you makes you stronger. You are going to fail. You know it. It's going to happen. You're going to have a game-winning kick in which you miss, right? That's going to happen if you're going to take a chance of being a kicker or a long snapper. You're going to have some bad snaps. You've got to be able to pick yourself up and believe in yourself that you can do it. If you miss the first kick of the game, does that mean you're going to miss the second kick? No. 
you got to believe that that means your chances of making the second kick are improved because you missed the first kick. you got to believe in that. you got to believe that failure does not make you weaker, it makes you stronger if you're in the right frame of mind about it. Okay? You have to believe in yourself. If you go out on the field and you're thinking those ant thoughts, automatic negative thoughts, you're saying, God, I hope I don't miss. I will be so embarrassed. If you're having those thoughts, you're going to miss. you got to go out on the field believing you're going to make it. You know you're going to make it. There is no doubt in your mind that that kick is yours. Okay? No matter how far it is. You got to believe it. You step up to the plate in baseball, you got to know you're going to make that hit. And the guys who have high batting averages believe they're going to make the hit. The guys with low batting averages hope they make a hit. Big difference between hoping and believing. Okay, you got to believe in yourself. You ever want to read an incredible book? Read this book by Norman Vincent Peale, it's The Power of Positive Thinking. That's one of the greatest books ever written. And, you know, the first three words in that book, the first three words he wrote are believe in yourself. That sums it all up right there. Okay. Vince Lombardi said, and I thought this was interesting, confidence is contagious. So is lack of confidence. That's a contagious attitude. When, when your teammates are feeling negative thoughts about the outcome of a game, people tend to absorb and it, it becomes contagious. Okay? And all of a sudden an entire team is defeated psychologically, even though the game is no real. Okay? But if your team is confident, they know they're going to win. You're going to, your chances of winning are increased dramatically. Okay, same with you. You have to have that absolute conviction that you're going to be successful in order to be successful. Self-fulfilling prophecy. What you decide will happen will happen. That's that's you got to you got to know that you you're the destiny of your own future. Who hopes? Everybody knows who Lou Holtz here is? Still alive? Great speaker. Um, amazing man if you ever get a chance to listen to his, his talks and read his books. Um, and he coached, of course, at Notre Dame and Alabama and South Carolina. His son has now just finished his uh, coaching stint at USF. Faith is the most important ingredient that we possess. Faith. Faith. Okay? What is faith? Well, let's look at it this way. Faith, to me, is, is believing completely in something that you have no tangible proof of. You don't have any tangible physical proof, but you still believe in it. That's faith. Okay? That's where faith comes in. It's a little different level than believing in the fact, this is a chair, it's right here, I can feel it, I can see it. So, it's easy to believe in it, but if you have something that you're asked to believe in, and you have no physical evidence that it exists, that requires this quality called faith. Okay? Faith is the most important ingredient that we possess in order to achieve. You either have faith or you will be filled with despair. And then he went on to say later on in his speech, the only thing losing sleep over is your salvation. Nothing else is really relevant. We worry about bad things that could happen. We rehearse in our minds often bad events, and we worry about it. And we stay up nights worrying about it. Anybody that's been a parent knows that. You stay up nights worrying about something that actually never came about. Right? And this, his concept is, you know, his passage here is, the only thing really worth is sleep about is your salvation. Okay? You have to have faith. And you have to have faith as an athlete 
in your own skills. When you go into a game, you can't be doubting yourself. When I look, talk to my kickers about their, their approach for a kickoff, the one message I tell them is, I don't care how many steps back you take. I don't care how many steps out to the side you take. I don't care if your approach is 10 steps or 6 steps or 3 steps. It makes no difference to me. Because it's not about how fast your body's moving forward, it's about how fast your foot moves through the ball. And that's two different things. The one thing I do care about is that you trust your steps. You trust your steps so much that you don't think about your steps. That's the key. You gotta approach the ball without thinking about your steps. But if you're stutter stepping up along the way, you're trying to adjust, you're doubting yourself. Your concentration, your focus is as has to be on that, that target that you're kicking to. Okay? You can't be focused on whether or not your steps are good because that is only gonna tie you up and make you not successful at that kickoff. You have to completely trust your steps. Snappers, when you get in onto the game field and it's time to make that snap, you can't be thinking about how to snap the ball. You just gotta get set up, get your alignment, and then execute thoughtlessly. Execute. You gotta trust your technique. You get into the game mode. Remember I said there's training mode and game mode. Training mode and playing mode. You have to trust your technique every day. If you do, you'll be better. You'll be much better. Same with golf. You gotta go and say, okay, I'm gonna take my swing, whatever I brought to the course today, and make the best game I can. I'm not gonna focus on technique. I'm gonna focus on a target that I'm gonna hit at. I'm gonna focus on my strategy in the game. But I am not gonna sit there and think about my technique while I'm do doing executing that technique. Because that will only tie you up. All right, I put this in here because when the idea, the concept of faith to me personally, I go back to thinking about the man that had the most faith of anybody I ever knew, <clears throat> and that's my father. And as I've said to you before, he coached here for quite a long time, basketball and baseball. And if you get a chance, if you have some time, go into their Hall of Fame, which I think is on the second floor of this building, and they have like a computerized TV thing touch screen and you can see the people that are in the Hall of Fame and they have this plaque over there and his name on the plaque. But I think what made him successful was this word right here, faith. Faith has a huge correlation to a positive attitude to success. There's a big correlation. There's a, one brings on the other. Now when he coached, he had a standing rule no matter what sport it was, didn't matter. No matter what religion his players were, didn't matter. His rule was, if you don't go to Mass the morning of the game with the team together, you don't play. Didn't matter if they were Jewish, didn't matter if they were whatever. If they didn't go to Mass, they didn't play. Everybody knew that rule. They knew he was going to stick to it. Okay? And if they were out partying that night... <laughs> They made sure they made mass the next morning. And I think that that was a big part of his success. Not because necessarily because God was blessing them and favoring that team. I think it was because that act of going to church made them believe that they had God on their side. And that made them feel much more po uh, powerful and much more capable of winning the game. Even if they were 20 point underdogs, because they all went to mass together, I think they all felt like, yeah, maybe we could beat these guys because God's on our side. And that, that, that faith allowed them to let it all happen, not have fear of failure. So I think that was a very powerful thing he did. I'm sure that probably isn't why he did it. But I think that was the outcome. He they won a lot of games. I think he had 463 wins, something like that, and, in basketball alone. And he had many, many, many championships and just a long, successful career. And then his predecessor who played for him, Steve Fritz, had even a better career 
and won a national championship in basketball here. But uh, he was he was um, the captain of my dad's team when my dad coached, and then his assistant coach for years after that. But uh, that faith was the big part of his success, um, and I'm sure it was. He was very successful as an athlete too. At 16 letters in college, 16. Can you imagine? It means he started for four years in four sports. Okay, played football. He played four positions in football: quarterback, safety kicker and punter. They never came off the field in those days. Okay? The greatest accomplishment is not, not in never failing. We all fail. It is in rising up again after you fall. Vince Lombardi. Okay? That's the greatest accomplishment. That's the measure of a man. That you can fail, you can miss that first field goal, in the, in the pressure test and come back and nail the next one. Right? You didn't let that first one get to you. When you get into a game and you miss a kick, don't think that that's going to mean that you're kicking bad today. That's a negative thought. Okay? That's a negative thought. That's a conclusion that's not true. Your previous kick has nothing to do with your next kick. Your previous snap has nothing to do with your next snap. They're independent events. So don't think that one has to perceive the other to be successful. They're just independent events. Okay? You have to understand that. All right. The hardest part in becoming a person with mental toughness is deliver. We all say, every, I hear this all the time. People say, well, you know, if you're going to be a good kid, you've got to be mentally tough. Okay? How do you be mentally tough? never hear an answer to that. Just say, so you got to have mental toughness. It's very important. Okay? How do you do that? That's what I'm here to tell you today. How to be mentally tough. How to be a man of steel out on the football field. Okay? you got to, in order to deliver, number one, fear of failure leads to doubting your mechanics while you are executing those very mechanics. Fear of failure has got to be eliminated. You got to believe in yourself and know that you're going to be successful. You just got to know it. Great athletes who are successful, when they, when we study them in research and sports psychology to find out what's the difference psychologically between those that are really successful at a high level and those that aren't, and the primary difference is positive self-efficacy. That means I know I'm going to be successful. That attitude is the difference between people who are successful and people who aren't. It's not necessarily skill level. It's not necessarily physical abilities. Sometimes those are equal. But it's the positive belief of what I can do and what I'm going to do the next time I attempt it, even if I've never done it before. So what we did, in, in, and this is something I worked on when I was working on my doctorate, is we created a, a sport that no one's ever done. And we made it really difficult. And we created these blinders, where there's like mirrors in it, and it screwed up their vision. And we tried to have them do a bowling with tennis balls into certain holes, like mouse holes in the wall. And they couldn't, because the, the, because of the blinders, they couldn't really see where they really were. Okay, but before they did that, we asked them, this is what you're going to do. How many tennis balls do you think you're going to get through the holes? And they said to predict what they were going to do. And what we found was a very high correlation between very successful athletes and what they predicted. The successful athletes predicted a much higher success rate than non-successful, not as successful athletes because they had a high self-efficacy in their psychology, in their mental state of mind. That's how they thought, okay? They didn't have fear of failure. They expected to be successful more often, okay? If you follow these very important steps, this is how you can deliver the goods. One, stay in a routine. 
Okay? I can't emphasize how important stay in a routine which never varies. When you go out, and I, you know, you ever watch basketball? What do the basketball players do, the good ones, before, to shoot a free throw? They go through a routine, dribble, 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 dribble. It's always exactly the same. Spin the ball, dribble one more time, look at the foot, you know, dribble one more time, take a breath, set up, and shoot. It's always the exact same routine. Tennis players, same thing. Bounce the ball, bounce the ball. They never vary their routine, ever. Golfers, getting set up, the way they hold the club, get set, the way they approach the ball. They stay in the, in the same routine. That is so critical because that routine guides your conscious mind to the motor memory that you want to use. That routine gets you to the right one. Every time you kick a ball, every time you snap a snap, or bowl a bowling ball, or golf a golf shot, your brain is recording that. Okay, and the analogy I use is, you tired? Yeah? I know it's been a long day, hasn't it? The analogy I use is this. Your brain works just like a computer. Okay, it stores it in a little, memory slot with a little icon okay and you got to somehow find the right icon because you want to say i want to do that good kick that i did last week not these 17 bad kicks i did yesterday you got to guide that brain that motor memory to the right program to click on okay that motor memory of that great kick you made once when everything worked perfect so you have to, number one, number one, have a routine that never changes, okay? So, you know, I, I, it, it can vary between different people. Your routine and your routine can be two different routines. You have to have your routine that's always the same. How you get set up, checking your alignment, checking whatever, okay? Doing the things the coach taught you to do taking your steps exactly the way you do it, okay? Not being sloppy. Not going back sloppy and half-heartedly, okay? But having a routine. That guides your brain to the correct motor memory. So make sure that your routine is the same. And what I tell my guys to do is this. When they've done their steps, they've gone through their routine, they get out there, they get set, I tell them to take one second to rehearse the kick, okay? One second to mentally rehearse the kick. See it happen in your head first, and it's always got to be a perfect kick. You don't want to rehearse a mistake, because you're gu guiding yourself to the wrong mode of memory. You got to rehearse the perfect kick in your mind. That is very powerful. You can do that in practice, by the way. You can mentally rehearse your kicks and then do the kick, and that is far more effective than doing either one separately. But you can practice these, these skills through mental rehearsal while you're lying in bed. You can practice being a better kicker and make yourself better just by mentally rehearsing correctly. Perfect practice. But to practice it and do it, statistically, uh, research-wise, is far better than, than either one by itself. Okay? So practice, mental practice, as part of your physical practice. Have a routine. And sometimes you can even use like a song, a lyric from a song, a poem. My son uses a biblical uh, verse. When he goes out in the field, he has a biblical verse that he says every single time. And that's the hook that helps you find the correct motor memory. It's part of your routine, and it helps to get you there. Okay? For me, it would be a certain song, Eye of the Tiger. Okay? That would be my mental hook. That would help me get in the right frame of mind to be able to, as part of my routine, get to where I want to be mentally. Okay? Number two, always choose a target. You've heard me say that now 1,900 times this week. Have a target for every skill, whether you're punting or kicking, kickoffs, doesn't matter. You have a target. 
Why is that so important? Besides the fact that you really need to do a target to get everything lined up correctly, besides that, that's technique. But it also is very important, having a target neurologically helps you get to that motor memory that you want to execute. It's part of that neurological process that gets you where you want to be, okay? So when you get set, okay, you've rehearsed it, now your eyes go from your target to the ball. You nod, you let them know you're ready, your eyes are on the ball, in your mind you're still seeing your target. Okay, your eyes are not on your target, but you can see it in your mind. Because you've got to keep your focus on that target. That helps you keep it off of technique. You don't want to be thinking technique when you're executing. Do you hear that? Okay, so rehearse successful execution. Mental practice, mental rehearsal. Okay, visualize. In other words, visualize you doing it properly. Visualize the end outcome being perfect. The greatest kick you ever kick, every time. Okay, there's an interesting story that kind of illustrates this, and again, it's going back to Lou Holtz. When they, one year, Lou Holtz, Notre Dame was playing West Virginia in the championship game, big game, the end of the season, okay? And so that week prior to practice, Every day, Lou Holtz ended practice by having the non-starters pick up and carry off the field the starters. Okay? He had them practice it every day. And you know what he was getting them to do? What? Believe they were going to win. They practiced what to do when they, after they won the game. That got them into the frame of mind. They knew they were going to win. They knew it, because they had to practice what they were gonna do after they won, okay? Very important. They were rehearsing successful execution with a successful outcome so that they would know they were gonna win it. A losing coach might say, now if we get beat, you guys, I want you to hold your heads up high. Okay, stuff like that, which is nothing wrong with that but now you're rehearsing law, failure, instead of rehearsing success in your mind. He wanted them thinking they were gonna win, and they did, they won like, by like six touchdowns. Okay, so number four, be thoughtless. How many of you parents ever told your kids to be thoughtless? Okay, now I'm gonna give you a new twist to that, because being thoughtless here means this. When you execute, don't think, do it. Just do it, because thinking about it will tie you up. And here's a great illustration. You know how gym, gymnastic coaches take young kids and teach them how to, how to do the, the beam? You know how they do it? They put the beam on the ground so that they're really only four inches up off the ground. And they have them practice balancing and doing their routine on the beam, okay? Why do they do that? Well, if they put the beam like five feet in the air, the fear of failure would be so great that they wouldn't be able to do any of it. They'd be all tight and worried about falling. But with two inches, three inches off the ground, there's no fear of failure. So they get really good and confident because they don't have to worry about the outcome, right? And they learn to practice it, and then they bring it up a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and they, they lose their fear of failure, okay? So that they can then execute. But if you have fear of failure then, you're up 40 feet trying to balance this thing that when it's lower, it's easy to do. But now it's up high, you get so tight, your muscles tighten up, they become spastic, and so you're more likely to not be able to do, walk across that bar, that beam, because you're worried about what will happen if I fail. I'll get hurt, okay? So when you execute, don't think about your technique. Don't have thoughts of, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta make sure, okay? Don't think, do it. Okay, that's playing time, game time, execution. Go out there, stick with your routine, go through your routine, see it, do it. See it, do it. Don't think about it. See it, 
pick your target, stay focused on your target, then execute it. Don't think about it, because thinking about it is the worst thing you can do. Okay, number five, I mentioned this earlier, but have a routine for post-performance. In other words, what do you do after the kick is over? You should have a routine for that as well, okay? Have a routine for what you do after a field goal kick or after a snap. That means, you, that way you stay in that routine. I don't care what that is, routine is. Well, I do care a little bit because some routines, at post performance routines are kind of unclassy. So I want my kid to do something classy, not unclassy, right? But like, for instance, you make a field goal, what do you do? Do you go running off on the field with both hands in the air and slide in your knees to the sidelines? Saying, look at me, look at me, I kick a touchdown. Or do you slap the backs of the players that were on the field with you that blocked for you and tell them, thank you, great job. Way to get that block, way to get that hold, way to get that snap. Have a routine afterwards and stay with that routine. That keeps you focused on what's important. On what's important. Lastly, I love this. Phrase. I put this on my blog uh, last week. I found this quote by a guy named Max Lucado, and I really don't know who he is, but this quote is awesome. Today, I will make a difference. I will begin by controlling my thoughts. A person is the product of his thoughts. I refuse to be victimized by my circumstances. I will avoid negativism. Optimism will be my companion. And victory then will be my hallmark. Optimism will be my companion. Today, I will make a difference. I love that quote. That's going to be my number one favorite quote from now on. He also said, I will not let past failures haunt me even though my life is scarred with mistakes. Who here has never made a mistake? I've made lots of them. I refuse to rummage through the trash heap of failures. Why spend time thinking about your past failures? I will admit them. I will correct them. I will press on. I will admit them. I will correct them. And then I will press on victoriously. No failure is fatal. Remember what I said earlier, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It is okay to stumble, I will get up. It is okay to fail, I will rise again. Today, I will make a difference. One last thought, be humble. If you are successful, be humble. Because it says in James, be humble before the Lord and he shall make you great. So my advice to you is when you are successful, be humble. Okay? Praise the people around you that helped you be successful. Because you never can do it alone. Okay? I've never seen one guy yet go out and kick a field goal without anybody else out in the field with him. You never do it alone. Be humble, and that will make you better. And folks, that's the end.